Welcome back to this episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. It's <laughs> nice to be back, eh? Yes, actually it is. Uh, it's been a, quite a time, but it, what, we were, weren't sitting on our... Laurels. Our, our laurels. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we were busy. And I'm happy that we can push the message now. Martin, we are living in such serious times. And I believe the message of the three angels must swell into a loud cry. It's time. So that'll be our focus. Mm -hmm. And nothing else should occupy our attention. That's true. So when it comes to current events, mm -hmm. then we will try and keep everybody updated as to where we are in the stream of time. And uh, we have a very important document coming up, the Laudato Si number two. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we will wait until it's there before we discuss it, because what's the point of speculation if you don't have it in your hand? That's it. No, we always uh, don't want to jump the gun. Yes, let's not preempt what yeah. he is going to say. We, we can glean a little bit of the past, and yeah. then we know where it's heading. And with Bible prophecy, we and know. And the 2025 agenda of the conservative lobby. Yeah. Well, we'll look at all of that in the future. But our focus is the three angels and everything has to slot into that. That's everything. Like you said, if we discuss current events, all has to come back into what the three angels' messages Correct. entail. And why, why are the three angels even necessary? They're necessary because the character of God is misunderstood. And that's why it's very important that we speak about the character of God and what it entails. But before we do that, we better pray. I'll pray for us in this opening. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being there for us the whole time, never leaving us. And we are heading into the times that you prophesied will be on our on our horizon so we ask that you help us through these future episodes and that you also will enlighten our minds in this episode and keep us safe in jesus name amen amen what in the character of god is such a huge topic you cannot really do justice to it in one discussion no it will be a a study a, for eternity. It's an eternal study, the character of God. And uh, the most misunderstood being in the entire universe is God, is God. except in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, where are we? Are we in the world or are we mentally in a better place? That's important. We are in this world, but not of this world. So that means our mind should be heavenward already. And that means if you want to be there, you will have to understand the character of God. When I was an atheist, I wouldn't want to be with the God that mm. I had pictured in my mind. And uh, so I think it's important that we set the stage for the three angels' messages by talking about the misunderstood character mm -hmm. of God. So our title is, Is God Love? Because that's what he claims to be, right? True. And uh, the Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. So let's look at some of these things. God is love. That's what the Bible says. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, Martin, this is a very, very important verse because there is this idea of dichotomy. Mm -hmm. The God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. That's it. Uh, the wrathful, vengeful God against this loving Jesus. Correct. It seems like a, an oxymoron, <laughs> like a misnomer. There's something amiss unless you make a deep study of it. Mm hmm and the churches have done a marvelous mm. job in distorting the character of God to the point of non-recognition. Yeah. And then the problem with that is that the non-believers are looking at this portrayal of God's character and then said, I don't want anything to do with this. They look at a middle age portrayal of the character of God as put forward by the church 
and believe that that is God. Yeah. And then that very church banned the Bible in the Middle Ages so that you couldn't find out what the character of God was. And when they finally had to capitulate to the Bible actually being there, they created so many versions of it that nobody knows who God is anyway. Yeah. And so let's rely on feeling rather than upon the word. So God does not change. That's very important. That means that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament must be the same. True. He's never changed. He's never changed. If that is true, if that is an axiom, well, then God doesn't change. And it says, Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hidden in that verse, you have mercy. <laughs> exactly. You have benevolence. Yeah. You have caring. You have love. Because if he really was as tyrannical as he is portrayed, the sons of Jacob would be consumed. That's now, the other question is, does God have favorites? Why are the sons of Jacob not consumed and the others are? Mm -hmm. we'll uh, aren't the sons it. of Jacob often just as bad as the others? Exactly the same. All right. So we have to look at all of these aspects. It's a very, very interesting verse. So first point, God doesn't change. Mm. There must be love and benevolence, otherwise everybody would be consumed because everybody's contrary to what God God says they should be. That's true. And also, that the fact that it does not change must give you peace of mind. Yes. Because one day you can be saved and the others you can be lost if he could change his mind. And if he really is a tyrant, well, then he's a tyrant forever. Right through the bank. Yes. Maybe he's a narcissist. Well, that's an accusation that is thrown towards God. Oh, yes. There are mm -hmm. many that say that God is a narcissist. Well, let's have a look at what Richard Dawkins thinks about God. And let me be honest. His thoughts are a duplicate of what I used to believe. Okay. Now, I'm sitting in a different chair now. Yeah. And I came to a different conclusion. But this is what he had to say. Maybe you can just explain who Richard Dawkins is. Well, Richard Dawkins is the evolutionary voice in the world. Mm -hmm. He is the one that uh, swings the scepter in the great universities of the world. And uh, he wrote many, many books. Is he a scientist? Yes, yes. He's associated with Oxford University. And uh, Cambridge and Oxford are constantly in debates about these issues. And of course, the issue of God versus uh, the the atheistic mm -hmm. view is is very prominent in their discussions. So he's a good representative of the establishment of liar oh, yes. learning. Oh yes, and he's received many many awards and is an acclaimed author. And when he opens its mouth, I think it's jewels that come out of his mouth. But as he speaks, so I thought. Yes, but also he represents then a ma the majority of people in higher learning in the science uh, milieu. Absolutely. All right, let's see what he has to say. I think he took the Oxford Dictionary and looked up every adjective that he could find of a negative nature and applied it to God. <laughs> so this is what he says. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in the whole of fiction. So automatically... He portrays the character of God and he puts the whole doctrine of the Bible in the category of fiction. Mm -hmm. And then he says he's jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. I'm glad I didn't have to pronounce any of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't leave it there. A little bit later, he goes to the portrayal of God in the New Testament, and he says, It is unfair to attack such an easy target. 
The God hypothesis should not stand or fall with its most unlovely instantiation, Yahweh, nor his insipidly opposite Christian face, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Well, that puts the God of the New Testament portrayal and the God of the Old Testament portrayal in the same category. Mm -hmm. Pathetic, yeah, right? That's what he's... Now, we would consider this a, a highly blasphemous statement. But this is what he honestly believes. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why does he believe it? That's the main thing. Yes. And why did I believe it? When I was an atheist and an evolutionist, and also at the university teaching the very things that Dawkins stands for, why did I believe that too? Well, so we have to dig a little bit yeah. deeper and find out why he believes that. And why did I believe it? He carries on after quoting a Catholic lady who had been traumatized by the Catholic teaching on hell. He writes, I was moved by her letter and suppressing a momentary and ignoble regret that there is no hell for those nuns to go to, replied that she should trust in her reason as a great gift which she, unlike less fortunate people, obviously possessed. So a lady wrote to him who had been traumatized by the doctrine of hell, mm -hmm. which was taught by the nuns, because yeah. in the schools the nuns give the religious instruction. And that's exactly why I was an atheist and thought that God was a bully, mm -hmm. a tyrannical tyrant, and uh, applied all the adjectives that he used as well. Yes, because they, I remember in your testimony, Yes. The nuns were telling that of your deceased mother. Now I've good news for Dawkins. Mm. He doesn't have to worry about it because the Bible knows nothing about the hell that the churches speak of anyway. True. So uh, he's somewhere on the wrong track. Now the doctrine that he's attacking here mm. and that gives him this impression of God is obviously a false doctrine. Mm -hmm. When you read the Bible... You do not find this doctrine. That's it. You can misread the Bible and assume this doctrine. But a deep study will show you that there is no such thing yes. as an ever-burning hell. Yeah. The wicked will consume away. That's it. They become ash. They will be ashes under your feet. They will be no more. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the wine of Babylon, and we'll get to those. Correct. Now the question is, if the wicked will consume away, then is God genocidal? Does he want to get rid of a certain group of people? And if so, why? So, uh, Richard, let me tell you that your anger is justified, but it is misdirected. Mm. He is angry at the doctrine of the church, yes. not at the doctrine of the Bible. Furthermore, Dawkins has no kinder words for the Protestant preachers of the day, quoting most of the mega preachers with their dominion theology, who advocate a reconstructionist model openly advocating a Christian theocracy for America. Now that is very interesting, particularly in the times that That's we are living in. Yeah. Because this is exactly what they are doing. And this is where it's heading. And this is where it's heading. And he's vehemently opposed to it. Now, uh, I believe the Bible, and I'm vehemently opposed to it. Exactly. So if you just put it in the right context, and you understand the character, then you can put the anger to where, it, where it's supposed to be. Where does the anger belong? Does it belong at the feet of the God of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Or does it belong or does it belong to the very ones that seem to want to represent him, the churches? Yes. So they want a Christian theocracy for America where they enforce their doctrines. And the question is, is it biblical what they want to enforce? Some of it might be. Mm -hmm. It will always be because 99% will be 
Good. Yeah. Is that one percent poison? Aha. Uh -huh. And then you will have a problem. Because then you will have to choose between their understanding and the portrayal in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So this should set the stage as to why people have turned against God. They have managed also to ridicule the Bible. Yeah. So that it becomes irrelevant. Yeah. So it, it needs a very, very deep study to actually discern what the conflict is all about. But very definitely, God's character is under attack. Under attack. Yeah. The portrayal of God's character in the world is horrendous. That's so the question is, is God love? With everything that it entails. Now Martin, I was walking on the way here this morning and I stopped at a bush with the tiniest little flowers on it, very unassuming. Mm. And I happened to take a closer look at the detail mm -hmm. and the, the absolute magnificence that is built into that little flower that nobody gives a second gaze. To. Yeah, you just walk you past. You just walk past it. And I looked at the detail and I thought, what kind of, what kind of creator would create something so sublime? Yeah. If you take now that same flower and you take a magnifying glass of, or even a microscope, then it even becomes more. <laughs> uh, the depth becomes unfathomable. Anyway, we read in 1 John 4 verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God. That's a profound statement. So if you do not have love in you, then you do not know God. So if you say God is not love, then obviously you're not understanding who he is. And then we have to look at the various aspects of love because mm -hmm. what people consider love today is often not love but passion. That's it. And when tested, it falls apart. Yeah. That's why we have so many disastrous relationships in the world today. And they're getting worse and worse mm -hmm. and worse. And then the Bible says, definitively, God is love. So you can only love if you are controlled by the power of God. Mm. So obviously, if the Bible says God is love, we must understand what is love. Yeah, what is love and why why does God act the way that he acts? Why does he come across sometimes as a stern task master? Why does he come across as a destroyer? What has that got to do with love? We have to, we have to be very careful how we look at that issue. Now verse 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So if you have true love, then you must have an association with God. Yeah. Otherwise you have a semblance of love or a false concept of love. So that just put new meaning in when you are a representative of God and his character. Yes. If you have the wrong idea of God and his character, then you're going to be portraying the wrong image. All right. Now, Martin, I've been looking at the presidential debates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I look at these people that are debating each other, they don't give each other a chance to talk. There is a constant interrupting and screaming at each other. There is there is total chaos as far as that is concerned. And uh, the ones that you're supposed to be working with that are apparently on your side because they're all in the same party yeah. become mortal enemies. Inside of that, there's no unity. No, there's no Just unity. Just after the election, then there's supposed to be unity on these people that... <laughs> so you, so you look at this chaos and you say to yourself, okay, do they really have a concept of God and what it means to, to love. Mm. And how do you love? Is it filial love? Is it association love? 
What is agapeo love? Um, I mean, we've spoken about that many, many times. The same with, um, is it, it must be other centeredness. So it's not selfish. It's all of these. Now, when you have these debates, these presidential Mm. debates, are you concerned about the welfare of the opposite <laughs> party or <laughs> are, you, are you approaching it from a selfish perspective? And how many times do they become personal and not even attack the situations? I hear they called uh, <laughs> Donald Trump Donald Duck now <laughs> <laughs> because he's ducking and diving the issues. I <laughs> see, <laughs> no. Anyway. Now, what does it mean when the Bible says God is love? Obviously, it's selfless agapeo love. All right. So the Bible is very clear that if you have the correct understanding of love and you exercise the correct understanding of love, then you must have an association with God who is the source of that love. 1 John 2 verse 5 says, But whoso keepeth his word, In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Mm -hmm. So here's a little proof text for us. How do you know? Well, you have to keep the word. That's it. Then what's the word? What is the word? This is the word. That's it. This is the word. You have to be in harmony with this word. And? Now, Martin, how many people or even how many churches are in harmony with this word? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word. There's no light in them. Okay. And if they have no light, then they have no love either. No. All because right. Because the love is uh, the light and love. So the, uh, the age old animosity that existed between Cain and Abel still exists today. True. And Cain will do his utmost to slay Abel. Yeah. Why? Because Abel kept the word. Yeah. And Cain didn't. No. And that means enmity. Enmity. And the enmity is actually towards God, but it's taken out on your... Well, they can't get to him, so <laughs> they get to the nearest thing possible, his representatives. All right, so that's what the Bible says. Now, uh, we ask the question, is God love? When you look at the portrayals in the Old Testament, and you look at it with the glasses that Dawkins had on, Well, then he's a bully. Mm -hmm. A tyrant even. Yes. So let's go to the New Testament. We're talking about the God that doesn't change. Now Dawkins separated the two. Yeah. He said (laughs) the one is actually the softy, pathetic one. Mm -hmm. And it's a different portrayal of the same evil one that you had in the Old Testament. Now let's have a look what Jesus had to say to the Pharisees. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe and mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Martin, there are some very deep thoughts in there. Now remember that the Pharisees were portrayal of God's church, mm-hmm. weren't they? Yeah, they were the representative. They were actually there to portray God's character to the world. Correct. So what the Pharisees did and what they taught and how they led the people was an expose of the character of God. But they left out two things, judgment and the love of God. Mm. They had a lot of love for self. Thank God I'm not like that one. Mm -hmm. So they elevated themselves. And they appropriated all the blessings to themselves and all the curses to the others. Is that love? No. That's selfishness. It should exactly. It should be that other way around. They should want to betray all the other the good things to the other people. All right. So Martin, are you saying to me that they distorted the love of God? Definitely. Didn't God want them to be a light unto the Gentiles? Yeah. Didn't he say that over and over? How did they treat the Gentiles? They treated them like lepers. Yeah, how did they treat the Samaritans? Yeah, terrible. Didn't even, I mean, yeah, they didn't even want to look upon them. But never mind talk. All right. To them. Now the Bible says while we were yet sinners, God mm. died for us, right? 
So that is love. Loving the unlovable. And I think God, in his wisdom, uh, sends us many unlovables. And he puts many of them into the church. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a test. Oh, for sure. Are we going to be like the Pharisees? Are we going to take the whole background of this individual that's so unlovable into account, mm -hmm. overlook all the objectionable character traits, and try and reach the, the person that he can actually become once exposed to the love of God. If you take in Jesus' day, why were the Pharisees so vehemently opposed to him? Because he was bringing all those characters into the church. He was taking the unlovables and turning them into lovables. <laughs> Right, And they couldn't stand it. They couldn't handle it. Why didn't he take uh, the educated, mm. fancy, well-robed Pharisees? Mm. No, he rebuked them. So there were two things that they ignored. Judgment. Fairness. Were they fair in their assessment as to who was to be saved and who was not to be saved? No. Did they use the correct measure? No, no they didn't. They used their own measure, not God's measure. They designed their own yeah. measure. So they distorted what the scriptures actually said. Mm -hmm. Do the modern churches do the same? Every, modern people do that. Okay. And so they misunderstood the love of God. And then he says this, you ought to have done. And you shouldn't have left the other undone. You can still pay your tithe. And you can do whatever you have to do, your yeah. rituals. As long as you do not ignore judgment. Now, Martin, if you have judgment, then you must have a standard of judgment. That's it. Mustn't you? You see, judgment has become a negative word to most people. All right. So if you want to have a judgment, then axiomatically you need a law. Yeah, that's it. Because you cannot be a judge without law. No. Because what are you going to judge by? You have to judge they by the law mm -hmm. and the love of God. So <laughs> These look like two opposites, that's right? It, that's a problem. But they have to both be there. All right. Let's see what God says about himself. Exodus 20, verse 6, he says, Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. How do you love God? By keeping his commandments. But why would you want to keep his commandments? Out of fear? Because you love him. No, so you don't keep his commandments out of fear, but you keep his commandments because you love him. Now, why would you love someone? Eh? Would you love okay. the, the unlovable ones? Yeah. Would you love them? God would. Yeah. He loved the unlovable and ones. why would you love him? Why would you love him? You need to understand Because him. you care for them. Because you and can, can relate all right, so them. if you want to love him, you need to agree with him. Mm -hmm. God loves those that, that don't agree with that him. That disagree as well. <laughs> I'm sure he loves Dawkins, right? If, of did course. He, did he die for he Dawkins? He died for him as well. All right, so he loves Dawkins, mm -hmm. and he loved me, and then he showed me his character in the Bible, mm. and I read that character with new glasses, totally new glasses. And I got the opposite of what I got before. Yeah. And so I learned that you can, you can love God. But to manifest that love, you have to keep his commandments. That's it. There's a work to be done as well. It's not just a thought. All right. It's no. an action as well. Now, Martin, if you love God and it's manifested by keeping his commandments, then the commandments must be a reflection of love. True, it must be a commandment of love. Okay. It cannot be separated. It can't because the thing is, mercy is also a portrayal of love. All right. Now, commandments mm. is that a law? Yes. All right. So, can it be a standard of judgment? Yes. So, judgment and commandments cannot be separated. No. Okay. But if you want to be justified all of us would like to be justified 
Declared so, just. De de declared just. So then it can be a positive thing if you are on the right side. All right. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Basically he's saying forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Martin, he is a just God. He is a faithful God. He keeps his promises. He keeps his covenant. Now covenant is a document of agreement. It's a legal document. Mm. Actually between Two parties. Two parties. So it's actually part of a law. Mm. And he keeps it. And he keeps it with those that love him and keep his commandments. So in other words, the commandments, the covenant, the uh, agreement, they have to be a unit. You cannot separate them. No. And he's keeping his side of this covenant. Of the bargain. Yeah. Well, that's what he claims. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've discovered what the problem is with uh, the church in Jesus' time. They had all the rituals. They had a wrong understanding. They neglected judgment and the love of God. Mm. And the love of God includes loving the unlovable, but it doesn't exclude judgment. No. Therefore, the unlovable must come into harmony with his love, and therefore that must be portrayed in keeping the commandments. Is that what it teaches? It's exactly what it teaches. Okay. Deuteronomy 30 verse 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. Martin, if somebody walks up to you and says, I command you to love me, it's not going to work. <laughs> no. <laughs> not going to work. In fact, it's going to... Be the exact opposite. opposite. You're going to rebel immediately. What? <laughs> Don't tell gonna, me what to do. I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> Go and find yourself another sucker. But as for me, uh, I'm not going to play that game. All right. So I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. It's a very important point. Mm -hmm. So is keeping his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments necessary in order to live and multiply? Yeah, to, have a life, hap to live happily, to have freedom. Okay, so is life associated with keeping the commandments? That's it. And then he says, I command you to love God. I, I command you to love me. I command you to love me, Martin. <laughs> Not gonna work. <laughs> no, you have to. There's some, you can. You must understand. Uh, no, or you must have this feeling that there's something, something more to it. More to this. All right. So let's look at it from another angle. Let's say he puts it all on the table. He says, "This is what I want." And I'm going to show it to you in great grandeur. In fact, I'm going to go to the top of a mountain. I'm going to make the mountain shake and quack. I'm going to write it in stone. And I'm going to write it with my own finger. And I'm going to give it to you. And I want you to talk about it when you get up. Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about it with your children. And I want you to talk about it when you go to bed. And I want you to study it through. And he gives it to you. And you ask yourself the question, okay, why must I do this? Once you have studied it, you are actually studying the character of God, mm -hmm. aren't you? Yeah, for sure. All right. So why would God command you not to kill your neighbor? For your own good and for your neighbor's good. Okay. Is he also commanding the neighbor not to kill you then? Exactly. So in other words, in order to live, you must let live. That's it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Why would he command you not to steal your neighbor's goods? Maybe it's for, your better, for, for you and for your neighbor. Because how would you <laughs> feel if your neighbor steals your goods, <laughs> right? 
Why would he command you to leave your neighbor's wife alone? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so that he's, he can leave your wife alone. <laughs> would your hair stand on edge if your neighbor <laughs> went looking for I don't think I leave my hair. <laughs> All right, so if you study it through, then you must realize that these laws are, are just. Yeah. They're, not, they're not burdensome, unless you want to be a criminal. Then they're burdensome. But, well, if I look at this verse that you just read, if you just swing it around and you ask a question, if you want the God to bless you, if you want to have a happy life, what must you do? Then he commands you to keep the statutes. All right. So by studying his requirements, you can get an idea of his character. Is that correct? Definitely. Okay. So when he says to you, I want you to love me, he's actually saying to you, study my requirements and see if you can live with those. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you say, no, I don't want to live with them, then ask yourself the question, do I want to live without them? Yeah. Do I want to live with the consequences? Yes, because if I live without them, that means I give free reign to my neighbor to come and mess with my wife, with my goods, to lie to me, to steal to me, to dishonor my name. Mm -hmm. All of those things. Now, if that applies to humanity, wouldn't it apply to God who made the rules in the first place? Definitely. All right, so why would you want another God if there is no other God? Yeah. Okay, so I think we can establish that if you want to follow this command to love God, then you need to understand His commandments and His statutes and His judgments because they are conditional to your life and to your prosperity. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So he simply has a, a simple statement of fact. Do this and you'll be happy. That's actually what this exactly what this says. If, for instance, the whole congregation was standing there and asking me, what must we do that we can be in the favor of God? Then he can answer, I command you to keep his commandments, to stay in his statutes. That's right. Oh, it doesn't force you, but there are consequences if you don't do it. Mm. Psalms 119 verse 127. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Now, Martin, when you love his commandments, then axiomatically you love him. Exactly. And if that is your attitude, then it won't be burdensome then it never, it's, a, it's never a heavy thing. So how important are the commandments? Well, it's life and death. All right. So the greatest display of the power and grandeur of God was at Sinai, yeah. where the law was presented and given and written in stone, which means it's immovable. I am the Lord, I change not. not. So I think we can establish that if you love the commandments because you've studied them and you're not studying them from a selfish point of view, mm -hmm. you're studying them from a benevolent point of view, both in the giving and in the receiving, then automatically you will love God. You know, on that mountain, when it was given, it's actually a gift that God gave. Yes. All right. Let's go a little bit deeper. Daniel. This is Daniel's prayer mm -hmm. in chapter 9, verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Is it a, a refrain that recurs over and over in the Bible? Right through. From Old Testament right through New Testament. Can you ignore it? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a central theme, right? It's a central theme. All right. So he keeps the covenant. He's a merciful God. And 
in order to receive all this mercy, you must love him. Mm. But in order to love him, to manifest that love, you have to keep the commandments. That's it. In other words, you have to come into harmony with his will. Yeah. I challenge anybody in the world mm -hmm. to go and look at the Ten Commandments and to show me where they are unreasonable. Yeah. People will try, especially in the first four. But that's pertaining to God, right? That's pertaining so to God. So start with the, with the last six, six and see this is your relationship that you have to have with your neighbor. Yeah. Therefore, what must your relationship be with God? Like you must show him respect. That's it. And you mustn't have other lovers yeah. because they're fake. Yeah. All right. So jumping to the New Testament, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Is there any change yeah. between what the Old Testament says and what the New Testament says? Can we honestly and faithfully record that God hasn't changed with regard to his commandments. Definitely, 100%. No change, right? No change. Whether it comes out of the mouth of Jesus, as in this case, if you love me, keep my commandments, mm -hmm. or out of the mouth of Yahweh, there's no difference. No difference. No difference. Same God. Okay. Just make sure, verse 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So if you don't keep the commandments, you don't love God. That's it. And it's not a selfish God that says this. It's just a fact. It's an, that's how it is. The consequences show you this. All right. So in other words, the commandments say, live and let live. Mm. Live and let live. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm. That's the commandment. That's love for your neighbor. And the same applies to love for God. Mm. Do what it says in the first four commandments. Mm -hmm. And you will be showing that you love God. You will show that you agree there's only one God. Mm -hmm. You will not ha have an idol. You will not blaspheme his name. Mm -hmm. And you will want to spend time with him. His time, his time that he designates. And not that someone else designates. So no difference. I am the Lord, I change not. Does it apply? Yeah. John 15, verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the portrayal of God in the New Testament, Jesus, is saying that he hasn't changed one iota from the God of the Old Testament, that what the requirements were of the God of the Old Testament were kept by Jesus, mm -hmm. and therefore he requires the same of you. That's it. Hmm? He did it, and he showed what the consequences is, that, the God, that you have to love God, and you should do the same. You should do the same. So if you keep the commandments, then you will abide in his love. In other words, you will stay there. Mm. You, will, you will remain there. And he gave us an example. The requirements of the Old Testament were fulfilled by me, therefore I want you to fulfill them too. That's it. Is that what it I said? didn't come and take it away to make it easier now for you. No. I came to show you that, that, is, that the Old Testament stands all right. and it, it can be done. Is it unreasonable of him to no, ask this? Not at all. Well, let's go to 1 John 5 verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. No. Therefore, is it unreasonable of him to ask this? It's, a command, it's the commandments of love. How can it be grievous? But Thomas Aquinas says <laughs> that it's reasonable for you to secure for yourselves the goods <laughs> of others to satisfy your needs. We see that in uh, where we live quite often, yes. That's a diseased <laughs> religion that yes. says something like that. Yeah. Because it's totally contrary to the word of God. Mm -hmm. And yet these so-called saints are the ones that give us natural law mm. on which all modern law is based. Yeah, It's amazing. We've speak, spoken about this many times. They take away ten laws, and they have to have to write thousands. And they don't keep any of them. And they don't keep it, and they can't even keep anybody safe. All right, what is happening in the world today? Mm. <laughs> Aren't the cities <laughs> in total chaos? Yeah. 
Uh, the police have been sent away. We don't need them anymore yeah. because do what your will has become the law. And what do you have? Total chaos. Are people happy with it? No. no. Everybody is... <laughs> and so the question is, Martin, once they become so unhappy that they cannot stand it anymore, which is where they basically are uh, now, mm -hmm. are they going to make draconian laws and God will get the blame? Yes, definitely. And will they make their laws or will they make God's laws? They make, they'll make their laws. Uh, they'll make some of God's laws, but then they'll have their own laws. In and they'll have their own interpretation. interpretation upon yeah. All right, Martin, we've established. So if you can imagine one city in the whole world that will keep the Ten Commandments, won't everybody want to go and live there? It would be marvelous. It will be heaven, it because heaven will be where all the commandments are kept. All right. So, Martin, this is the bottom line. If you want to understand the love of God, you have to understand His law. And once you've established that the law portrays love, mm -hmm. And you love the law above fine gold because, wow, well, if everybody keeps it, you're safe from interference from your neighbor. Then, Martin, then you will love God automatically. I just had a thought. So if anybody tells you, don't preach the commandments, preach the love of God. That's a misnomer. That's an oxymoron <laughs> because you can't do the one without the other. That's it. Okay. So we've shown this a hundred times already, but we'll show it a hundred and one times, maybe a hundred and two, <laughs> until people finally get it. So if you look at the character of God and the character of the law, and you look it up in the Bible, you will see that it says that God's character is just. Mm -hmm. Romans 3 verse 26. And it'll say the law is just. Yep. Romans 7 verse 2. And so you can go down. God is true. The law is true. God is pure. The law is pure. God is light. The law is light. God is faithful. The law is faithful. God is good. The law is good. God is spiritual. The law is spiritual. God is holy. The law is holy. God is truth. The law is truth. God is life. The law is life. God is righteous. The law is righteousness. God is perfect, the law is perfect. God is forever, the law is forever. But now, Martin, the law is not a person. No. It's a set of rules. It's a mirror. Yes. It's a mirror of God's character. All right, so if you look in the mirror and you fall in love with yourself, then you've actually fall. <laughs> if you look at this mirror, you fall in love with God. That's it. Because that's what it portrays. That's it's it. It's the image. And if that mirror is showing you things that you're not doing, then you're not in harmony with that character. All right. So you cannot separate the law from the character of God. Mm. Now, if you love the law, you've, you're in love with a book. Mm. Uh, isn't it better to love uh, the actual person? That's it. All right. So love the law, you automatically love God. Yeah. You cannot separate them. No, because that also becomes problem problemsome. All right. Now, what n theoretically, if somebody doesn't keep the law, everybody's happy, right? If somebody kills your child, mm. you're perfectly happy because somebody's finally killed your child. That's ridiculous, right? That's it. You're going to be up in arms. You're going to scream for justice. That's it. We need to discuss this yeah. in some detail in future. So if anybody transgresses the law, everybody is up in arms, but nobody wants to keep the law. Then how does that work, Martin? That's how. Or what about doing away with the law entirely? Yeah, no. Jesus took away the law. But he just said keep it. How could he have taken away if he says keep it? That's a misnomer. So, Martin, let's look at the other aspect, the wrathful deity, the wrath of God. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, we just read that God is righteous and that the law is righteous, mm -hmm. right? Righteousness is portrayed in the law and righteousness is the character of God. And the wrath of God is against unrighteousness. So that will be against lawlessness. That's against lawlessness. 
All right? Now, Martin, if somebody comes and bludgeons your child to death, are you going to be angry? Yeah, for sure. Are you going to be wrathful? Yeah. Are you going to want to do something about it or have something done about it? You want justice to be, to, to be done. Then you want vengeance to be taken on this person that did it. Then why do you want to scream at God if he has the same sentiments? That's it. Very good. Huh? You can. So, Mr. Dawkins, if God is a God of justice and God wants to un uphold righteousness, mm -hmm. why are you screaming? Yeah. Why are you giving him all kinds of names and negative connotations? If he is going to uphold righteousness, mm. then you sh should say, thank God there is someone at least who is trying to keep sanity in this world, yeah. right? Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 1. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. And then verse 3 says, So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og, also the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. Mm. Now there's a genocidal God yeah. that gave an order to wipe out Og and everything that pertains to him. Go and wipe them out. So now this is a vengeful, wrathful God. This is God. a yeah. vengeful, horrible, wrathful, genocidal God. You could look at it like that. Mm -hmm. But you could ask yourself the question, why would a God who mm -hmm. says that he is love give a command like that? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that Og and his entire nation had passed the point of no return? Yes. There's no return from where they've gone. So they cannot return? Yeah, they've already past that point where God's mercy was. They became so evil and so murderous and so perverse that they were a curse to humanity. And the only solution was to remove them or else all humanity would eventually become contaminated. Mm -hmm. Martin, if the evil in the world were to be allowed to go unchecked, yes. Wouldn't eventually the whole world become evil? That's, you have glimpses of the, this happening, where places where they've just let people carry on and not implement the law, what happened? It's actually chaos. So here's another point, Martin. In this portrayal here in the Old Testament, God was enacting a theocracy. Mm-hmm. It was a, a theater. Yes. It was a stage set. Yeah. It was something that the nations should witness, like a soapy. Mm -hmm. You switch on the television and you look at the next episode. Here's a portrayal of what God requires. He requires absolute obedience to his commandments mm -hmm. because any transgression of the commandments means pain to someone. Yeah. And he wants no pain, yeah. no more tears, mm. no more pain. That means no transgression. Because any transgression is going to cause pain. Yeah. If somebody's going to kill something that belongs to you, you're going to have pain. That's it. So nobody may kill, mm. Mm. right? Nobody may steal. Nobody may lie. There must only be truth. Then there will be no pain. Yeah. So here was an enactment. And he enacted it not only with the nations around, the most wicked of them, but even amongst his own people. Yeah. Because there's no shadow of turning with him. What applies to the one applies to the other. Mm -hmm. It applies to everyone. He changes not. Correct. But here he had a professed people that said, everything you have commanded, we will do. Yeah. Of course, they didn't. No, but... But they nevertheless, they professed. Yes. Isn't that the church? That's the church. The church is supposed to profess everything that you said we will do That's because it. you believe it, you're convicted of it. It doesn't mean that you will not stumble and fall. No, it doesn't mean that the, that the persons in the church do that, but the church has to acknowledge this is what we'll do. All right, was God just then if we look at it from that point? Yes. Where these people were sacrificing their own children, 
where they were torturing people relentlessly, where they were breaking every single commandment in the most horrendous way, and even bringing that into their religious systems, that God said, this system is so corrupt and so evil, it needs to be eradicated because this will never be allowed to exist in my future heaven. Exactly. This was a portrayal of this has to be done because this was, is the same that will be done to have heaven without a stain. All right, let's ask another question. Did justice demand mm. the execution of Og? Yes. And everything that pertained to yes. him? Because everything had become corrupt. Yes. All right, if we look at it from that way, then let's go back and look at the covenant with Abraham. Genesis 15 from verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. That's a type. Mm -hmm. We are actually in a land of slavery. Yes, we are in a land of slavery. All right. And God is permitting it. And the situation is supposed to bring us closer to him and therefore change our characters into a similitude of his, mm -hmm. right? So they were strangers, and we are strangers in this world. And they shall afflict them 400 years, that's the time. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. That's a promise. That's a promise of deliverance. Mm -hmm. Do we have a promise of deliverance? Yes. So this is a type, right? Yeah. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. You won't see redemption. You will die. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God did not bring this nation out of Egypt under his control, under his power, and use them as an example to the world of what will happen to those that reject his law. Yeah. And he says that he's not going to permit them to wipe out those nations whose land they were mm -hmm. going to occupy, the Canaanites, yeah. who were the most evil of all the people on the planet, the most perverse, mm. because their iniquity was not yet full. How much time did he allow them? 400 years. 400 years. Is that long-suffering? Imagine a city in the world today that has no laws, that, has, evil. that is allowed to still go on for 400 years. Uh, do we have this interesting debate in the United States at the moment? Yeah. Lawless cities yeah. as opposed to non-lawless mm -hmm. cities? Interesting, that's right? What, you see, that's why I'm bringing it up. If you look, on, So you can already see where it's heading. It will be towards the godly one, but it will have a sting. All right. Okay. Now, Martin, if a city really becomes wicked... Mm. Uh, would God have the right to remove it, like Sodom or Gomorrah? I was thinking about that just earlier. The, if you take the previous verse that we read about them, the, the Og and the Bashan, it's similar to when God said to Lot, he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, no, but what if there's still people that's not... Um, so that's the first thought that comes up when you read that section of Og as well. Weren't there any people that might still have changed? All right. Did, did God apply that uh, discussion that you have now with Abraham when it came to Sodom? Exactly. Didn't he say, what if there are 50? And he came down to, what if there are 10? Yeah. And in the end, how many came out? Three. Three. So that's the same. When God is merciful for 400 years, do you think when it's up, that he knows that there's nobody else that puts All it. All right. Does he have the right to act that way? Isn't yeah. he the creator? Yeah. All right. A a let me ask another question. Is it an act of love and mercy to eliminate them? Yes. Exactly, right? It is. And what if they were going to murder every single one of you? Isn't it, don't, don't the police today or the military 
Don't they assume the right to eradicate someone who is such a danger that he will kill everybody around him? That's it. You have to take him out. You have to. Now, if that is perfectly acceptable in the times that we are living in, how much more so in the judgment of God? How mm. merciful was he? 400 years. And, but isn't it interesting, just what you mentioned, that there are very many people in, in society today that don't want the police to have that. Correct. But they then don't they want, want to live in lawlessness. Then they want to be like Sodom. Yeah. All right. So the wrath of God towards the lawless ones, Og, Sodom, mm -hmm. Gomorrah, you can go through it, the Amalekites. Whenever God gave the command, it's over then they were to be eradicated. Now, in the case of other nations, like the Philistines, mm -hmm. for example, did he eradicate them all? No. No. He didn't. And when it came to the Moabites or any one no. of them, did he eradicate them all? No. No. There were only some where he said, eradicate them all. They had become so corrupt that uh, it was necessary to eradicate. Yeah. It, like you said earlier, this is a type of where we're heading towards if you want to go to heaven. This cannot exist as a threat to the church. And remember that was a theocracy. It was an enactment mm -hmm. of a greater reality. We're not living in a theocracy now. We're going to go back to a theocracy because the theocracy that will finally be implemented one is the heavenly one, mm -hmm. but not here on earth. No. That'll be a false one. That's the thing. So Dawkins, relax. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question that I think people might have. What about the way in, wha in which they got rid of these nations? Well, very often God himself got rid of them. They didn't even have to lift a little finger. Yeah. But we must also remember that sometimes the people that had to do it, the eradication went beyond what God was asking of them. Correct. Well, you see, when God eradicated someone, it was quick. Yeah. 185,000, they were alive one moment, they were dead the next moment, the Syrian army. Mm. Or when he fought on behalf of God's people, he eradicated them. Not like the um, Assyrians that tortured people to death mm. slowly. Mm. God is not a tyrant or a monster. He eradicated them. His people might have gone too far in some some cases, some cases, but not God. But still, the original purpose of God wanting that eradicated was yes. not wrong. In other words, there was a mass murderer on the loose, and he had to be eradicated before he destroyed everyone. That's it. That's the way we should see it. Now, the wrath of God is not only towards idolaters, mm. but the God, wrath of God is against anything that is contrary to his defined will. Mm. So if we look at the wrath towards idolaters. And we look at 1 Samuel 15 verse 18. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. There's an example. There's a direct command of God which Dawkins would interpret as genocide, mm. right? Where he says, go and destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. Now he defines the Amalekites as sinners. Mm -hmm. And sin is the transgression of the law, according to John, right? Mm. So they were transgressors of God's law to the nth degree. And they had to be consumed. So there was a command Wipe out the Amalekites. They are a curse upon the earth and they will contaminate and destroy humanity. Get rid of them. Their spirit is mm -hmm. contagious. And this, this command to destroy the Amalekites was given to King Saul, right? 1 Samuel 15, 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Mm. Firstly, he didn't destroy everything. No, because the king is still there. God made such an example of them, they weren't even to take their goods or their mm. animals. 
They want to enrich themselves from the products of evil. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of it all. It's like taking a pot of gold and dumping it into the sea. Yeah. Very hard for them to do because they rather wanted the contaminated washed money mm. than to do without it. So he brought the sheep because he didn't want to sacrifice his own sheep and he was selfish and he didn't kill the king of Amalek and it's obvious that he didn't kill them all because the Amalekite remnants were still there for a very, very long time. So he didn't do what he was told to do. Mm. He had to get rid of them all and he didn't do it. Now let's have a look at the death of Saul. 2 Samuel 1.12 he, he and his son were killed, right? Mm. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. So eventually Saul was overcome by his enemies. Mm -hmm. In this case it was the Philistines that they fought against. And then we read in verse 13, And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? Mm -hmm. And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. Mm -hmm. Now Saul had fallen and he wasn't dead. But he had been severely wounded and he knew that he was going to die. So he fell upon his own sword, mm -hmm. but that didn't kill him either. either. So then he called this other guy, who happened to be this one, and he happened to be the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. Yeah. And he killed him, he chopped his head off, right? Mm -hmm. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thy hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Mm, so he took care of the Amalekite. He took care of the Amalekite. Now what's the moral of the story, Martin? Mm? The moral is if you do not kill the Amalekite, mm -hmm. he's going to kill you. He's coming back and he's chopping your head off. All right. Now the Bible defined the Amalekites as sinners. Transgression of the law. So let's reduce it to sin. Sin. If you do not kill sin in your life, it's going to kill you. Yeah. You have to kill it. Mm -hmm. You have to die to self. So is this unjust what has transpired here? I mean, what did the man do? He did, he did what Saul, Saul asked, asked him. him. And if Saul did what God asked him, that man would have not been there. That man would not have been there, no. And he probably wouldn't have had the battle with the Philistines and lost it. Exactly. Everything would have turned out differently. Mm -hmm. So one little disobedience and you have dire consequences yeah. for the whole nation. Yeah. Because not only Saul was affected, the entire nation mm. was affected. Thousands upon thousands suffered as a consequence. Yeah. So Martin, the moral of the story is, if God is a God of love, then God is a God of justice as well. Mm. The standard of justice is the law. That's it. And the law defines sin. And once sin reaches a point of no return, mm -hmm. then it has to be eradicated together with the one who is performing it. Mm -hmm. So is this unjust or is this just? It's absolutely just. All right, let's compare it. A mass murderer is on the loose. He has an assault rifle. He's indiscriminately killing people left, right, and mm -hmm. center, is it just for the police to take him out? Yes. Yes. Is this what God did? Yes. This is what God did. But he applied it to a whole nation mm -hmm. that was going to destroy the rest of humanity if it was permitted to exist yeah. any longer. Now let's look at the wrath of God towards his own people because God is a fair God. He doesn't have two measures. He doesn't have two standards and he requires his church to exercise justice and the love of God. Mm. Didn't we see that? All right, let's look at a very interesting example that is also very painful to many in the time that we are living in. And this comes from Psalm 78 verse 27 and refers to the time when God permitted the people to eat 
flesh that he had withheld from them in the form of the quails. So he rained flesh upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. So this is Hebrew parallelism. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this is also betraying the story that happened in Exodus. Correct. And he let it fall in the midst of the camp round about their habitations. So they did eat and were filled. For he gave them their own desire. Mm. And let's just stop there. This own desire that they had, was it in harmony with his will for them? No. No. No, because he did provide. Correct. Now, he first provided them, well, he provided them once because they lusted thereof mm -hmm. and there was no rebuke. No. And then he tried to teach them a better way and they refused and they lusted again mm -hmm. and this time there were consequences. So he gave them their own desire. Mm -hmm. They were not estranged from their lust. They hadn't changed. No. They still lusted for what was not for their own good. Now, Martin, if the scriptures are correct, then who designed you? God did. And if he designed you, will he know what's best for yes. you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I am a diesel engine, he's going to tell me to put diesel fuel in. All right. Not petrol. <laughs> okay. So as your designer, he tells you what's good for you. But you say to him, I don't care. Yeah, I like the petrol. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do what I want to do. It's going to give me more vuma. <laughs> so he says, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll teach you a lesson. I'll give you what you desire yeah. because you are not estranged from your lust and we'll see what the consequences are. So you end up with cancer. You end up with all kinds of diseases and you scream to God for his unfair treatment of you. Is that how it works? Yeah. So God, in his wisdom, gives you a blueprint. And he tells you this is what, what is required. This is what you are designed for. And let me tell you why. Mm. There will be no death in heaven. Nobody's going to kill anybody else's pet. Because that person will be very upset when you kill his pet. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be no death. So please get used to it that I have created plants for your well-being. So the original diet of man was fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds, and then vegetables were added. And that's where it was supposed to stay. There will be no death. Mm -hmm. The rest is harmful for you. I don't want you to have it. But I'm not estranged from my lust. I want it. All right, I'll give it to you. Mm. Is that unfair of God? No. So if a child insists on doing something that is harmful to it, a parent will sometimes allow him to go just far enough to feel the consequences. Mm. And maybe he'll learn a lesson. And then while the meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. So here was a retributive action of God against his own people. They wouldn't listen. Mm. That was a theocracy. We are now not living in a theocracy, so God is long-suffering for mm. 400 years and many generations. Mm -hmm. But the consequences are horrendous, right? And then what does it say? For all this they sin still and believed not for his wondrous works. This is the condition that humanity has. That's it. It's called the fallen nature. Mm. And God wants to restore that fallen nature. And in order for that fallen nature to re be restored, you must come into harmony with his commandments and his will. That's it. Now, there are ten moral statutes, mm -hmm. but they don't negate the laws of physics and the laws of physiology. No. So he's given health laws as well. And they need to be obeyed. That's it. And not because God is a tyrant, but because it's for your own good it's and for your well-being. <laughs> because he's a God of love. And, and eventually, eventually for the well-being of everybody around him. There was a preacher. His name was 
Richard O'Full. He's dead now. And I met him many, many years ago, and I sat in many of his sermons. He was a sweet man. I, I really liked him. And uh, he would always, <laughs> always give an example. His wife's name was Betty. And uh, he says, if I transgress the laws of health, who suffers? Betty suffers <laughs> because she has to take care of me. So he would bring this into every sermon. Who suffers? It's Betty that suffers. Yes, and this is the way it is. If we create this burden, everybody else I'll around see. us suffers. So part of human nature is to want to sin still. Yeah. So God is just as righteous and just with his own people as he is with the nations around. That is a very important point, and I hope people understand that because that's what you've just shown. It's not that he's got favorites and the others are just the whole time giving enemies. enemies. Correct. Psalm 78 verse 38. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned his anger away mm. and did not stir up all his wrath. And that is either true or it's a lie. Yeah. Did True. it apply to the nations? Didn't he give them 400 years? Yeah. Didn't he forgive and didn't he stay his wrath? Mm -hmm. The same with his own people? The same with his own people. So that's his character. Now, why does he have such bad press, Martin? So what does the Bible require of us mm -hmm. in the light of this? It's to put on a new self. Colossians 3 from verse 1. And if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Is the law of God kept in heaven? Yes. Definitely. Because the transgressors have been removed from heaven. Hasn't yeah. Satan and his host been cast out? Cast out. Was he a lawbreaker? Yes. Yes, he was a murderer from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He was a thief and a liar from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that's breaking the law of God, right? Yep. He's out. So if you set your affections on things above, then you must live according to things above. That's it. Do we have a record of that? Yes. Yes, it's in the Bible, mm -hmm. right? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So... It's absolutely essential that the old person in us die. Yes, and also very important, it's not on your own. No. It's hid in, with Christ, in God. In God. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now glory mm. always refers to the character of God. Very important. So in other words, the character that you have to emulate here on earth is the character of God. And as we've seen, the character of God is portrayed in his commandments. And that will give glory to him. That will give glory to him. So how do you achieve that? You have to mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. So if your stomach tells you what it craves, you tell it, no, I'm going to give you what's good for you. Right? <laughs> I'm going to make it so palatable that you enjoy it. I don't have to be a martyr as far as that is concerned. <laughs> because obviously God created it to be enjoyed. But the finer details, uh, the discernment of the palate has to be retrained from the harsh <laughs> mm. rock music that it was used to. That's it. To the finer melodies of the food and its daintier aspects and you have to forego fornication mm -hmm. leave your neighbor's wife alone you're going to hurt your neighbor uncleanness when you watch television or you switch on something unsavory uh, what your eyes feast on the mind becomes contaminated mm -hmm. with so stay away from uncleanness inordinate affections evil concupiscence, covetousness. All of these are idolatry. Mm. So Martin, does God require a change? 
change, what you listen to, what you watch, what you do, how you speak. Now isn't it interesting that if people practice all of these things, everybody is angry with them. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't want to do it themselves. Yeah. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So the wrath of God applies to the children of disobedience whether they be in the world or mm -hmm. whether they be in the church. God is not going to make a difference. No. The standard is, is the, the commandments. All right. In which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So we were children of disobedience. Mm. And we did all of those things. And we would have to stop doing them. But now ye also put off all these things. So... Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Martin, do you struggle with anger? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but at, at least you're honest. Uh, uh, at least with God, it can be overcome. God has righteous anger. We often have unrighteous anger. Yes, that is a problem. But I will always, and I'll say it again, if you ask God, God help me with my anger, he's not going to take everything that causes anger away. No, he's going to especially expose uh -huh. you to it. It's going to, to come. give you training. That's it. Wrath. Now the wrath of God, as we have seen, is tempered with mercy. Mm -hmm. The iniquity is not yet full. I'll give them 400 years. Then, I'll, then it's done. Then yeah. I'll wipe them out. Our wrath is often untempered with mm -hmm. mercy. Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. I listen to conversations sometimes and every second word is a swear word. Mm. I used to speak like that. I used to as well. You did? And now your ears hurt when you sit in a conversation like that. Okay, so that. it's possible for God to change you, yeah. right? Lie not one to another seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And Martin, all of these things, lying is a part of the Ten Commandments. Yes. Filthy communication mm -hmm. out of your mouth is a part of the Seventh Commandment. Mm -hmm. Blasphemy is a part of the Commandments. Yeah. Anger, wrath. Doesn't the Bible equate anger and wrath with murder? Yeah. It's a part of the Commandments. Yeah. So Martin, what is this telling you? Come into harmony with what? With God's character, and that is keeping his commandments. Okay, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Mm. So is God a wrathful deity, or is God a just God, mm. a merciful God, with a very distinct standard, and he tells you to come into harmony with it. That's it. And, and if you don't, then you choose death. That you choose death, and to do it is for your own benefit, for your own good. Correct. So if, if the heavenly society is going to be without malice, without all of these things, then everybody who practices them must be removed. That's it. And they're not going to be put in hell to roast forever. They're going to be gone no. and forever. Once again, it's their own choice. God does not interfere with the choice. He tells you, okay, this is the best for you. But choose if you want to. But if you don't, you're going to have to live with the consequences or, for that matter, not live. Okay. Now, the Bible calls this work of God of executing justice, calls it a strange work. Mm. Isaiah 28 verse 21, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. In other words, God is a God of love. God is a God of life. He's not a God of death. So when he actually exercises this wrath, it's with a tear in his eye. Mm. It's a strange act. It's contrary to his character. Mm. I think in Job it says something similar. Let me just grab, I think it's Job 31 or 30, 30 something. Let me just look in Job. Ah, yes, it's Job 31, from verse 1. 
And Job says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. <laughs> That's a very nice way of saying, I'm not going to look at anything bad or filthy. I'm going to guard the avenues of my mind. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Mm. There goes pornography, right? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? In other words, if I transgress, what will be the consequences? Mm. Is not destruction to the wicked? Mm. And a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity. Hmm? Yeah, it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's a strange, it's strange. Act. Here you have it in the book of Job. There you have it in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. It is not God's will to destroy. No. It's God's will to make people realize that there are rules and there is a standard of righteousness. So Deuteronomy 31 verse 12, gather the people together, men and women and children and the stri thy stranger that is within thy gates. So who is supposed to be involved in this message? Everyone. Every single one. There's nobody excluded. That they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Mm. It's the bottom line. It's a theme throughout the Bible. And Romans 6 verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is that a choice? Yeah. There's a choice there, you right? You have a choice. So whose responsibility is it if the wrath of God is poured out upon you? Your own. Then who's the tyrant? Unfortunately, you are. Unfortunately, yourself. You are the tyrant. You have brought this upon yourself. If you take a gun and you start shooting innocent people all around you, you have brought it upon yourself that you're going to be taken out. That's it. Your choice. Is this a wrathful deity or is this a sound lawmaker and enforcer? Yeah, definitely sound. Is it tempered with mercy? Yes. Will there be a lot of negotiation to try and make you change your mind? Yes. Will they be... Is the negotiator then evil? No. <laughs> and if the negotiation fails and he takes you out, is he the villain? No. Who's the villain? You, yourself. Ezekiel 18.31 Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will you die, O house of Israel? Can you see the negotiator? Uh -huh. And he's crying actually. He's asking why? Listen, put that gun down. Mm. Stop killing innocent people. Start doing what is right. Please, I don't want to kill you. Mm. Huh? Is this 33? He's actually not killing you. You're killing yourself. Correct. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? What kind of a negotiator is this? <laughs> if you cannot f actually see that even where he says, I command you to keep the commandments, it is because I want you to turn from your evil ways. And I want you to live. All right. Now, when he does his strange act, that is the execution. John eleven thirty five, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Mm. What does that tell you about the character of God? It's a loving character. It's a caring character. Okay. Uh, why did he weep? Because he saw that the world does not want to listen. Okay. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Were they destroyed? Yeah. Did he weep? Yes. Did he prevent the destruction? No. 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 He warned and warned and said to them, this is what's going to happen. Is Turn there, from your ways. Is there any change in this God of the New Testament as opposed to the God of the Old Testament? No, and that will be the same at the end. So Martin, 
people that claim that the God of the Old Testament is the tyrant and the God of the New Testament is a wishy-washy nobody, are they correct? No. No, they haven't made a deep study of it, right? And the problem lies not with the God, but it lies with self. All right. Now this message must go out to the world. Mm. And Martin, what if I tell you that the message is actually portrayed in the third angel? I know. Would you believe that? I, I'm sure we can find out. <laughs> All right, Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, mm. which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Was Sodom and Gomorrah tormented with fire and brimstone? Yes. Was it destroyed? Yes. How long did the people suffer? They were gone. Gone. How long did it take for Lot's wife to turn into a pillar of salt? Immediate. Okay. So in other words, when God's wrath is poured out, when they have passed the point of no return, then uh, will it be because he never exposed them to their problem? No. Nope. Never did any pleading on their behalf? No, it's been merciful for more than 400 years. All right. The third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, I really want to know who the beast is. But, we, again, but if means there's a choice. Yes. Or the image, or you receive the mark, then you have rejected God. And the wrath of God will be poured out on you. It's a warning to the world. So Martin, here's a quote from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. From the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character and to excite rebellion against his law. Martin, has he been successful? Yes. For almost 6,000 years, he's been very successful. Okay. And to think that he used the institution, the church, mm -hmm. to change God's law and to teach others to do the same, that's horrendous. Because I'm the Lord, I change not. And this work appears to be crowned with success. The multitudes give ear to Satan's deceptions and set themselves against God. But amid the working of evil, God's purposes move steadily forward to their accomplishment. To all created intelligences, he makes manifest his justice and benevolence. Mm, there you have those two. You cannot separate the two from each other. Through Satan's temptations, the whole human race have become transgressors of God's law. But by the sacrifice of his son, a way is opened whereby they may return to God. Through the grace of Christ, they may be enabled to render obedience to the Father's law. Thus in every age from the midst of apostasy and rebellion, God gathers out a people that are true to him, a people in whose heart is his law. Mm. Is that in harmony with what we just read? Everything, all the scripture tells us. If you want to be in harmony with God's character, you have to obey his law. Here's another quote from Christ's object lessons. Behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Do we have that situation now? I think everybody can acknowledge that it's turning very dark. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. He has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. Hmm, Martin, is this true? Mm-hmm. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory. That's his character. Mm -hmm. The light of his goodness, his mercy, and his truth. And that message is threefold. It sounds harsh. Yeah. If you don't do it, you're going but to be destroyed. The wrath of God is going to be poured out upon you. We must equip you. people to see what that message is. And that's the three angels' messages. And there's another quote from Christ Objects Lessons. 
those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. So the three angels' messages are a revelation of the character of love. Yes. Will the world gladly accept them? No. Will some accept them? They will. It's a warning message. It's a warning. And it requires a change of heart. The children of God are to manifest His glory. That means they must manifest His character. Mm -hmm. That means they must be in harmony with His law. Mm -hmm. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done from, for them. In other words, change them from lawlessness to mm -hmm. lawful. This is the message that has to be brought to the world. And it sounds like a harsh meth message. Mm -hmm. And it will be misinterpreted. It will. But it is a message of love. Yeah. It's a message of calling people back into harmony with God. Mm -hmm. Into his character. And it is a message calling you back into harmony with his will, which has been portrayed in this book. So and has been given as a gift to us. Yes. So Martin, that is the story of his character. Now we've only used a few examples in the Bible. We could use mm. many, many examples. But the basic essence will remain the same. And until we study this through, God's character will be misunderstood. Yeah. And unfortunately, the churches in the world are doing a good job of misapplying the scriptures, even going so far as to remove the law. Mm -hmm. Now we see what that does in the world. When That's you it. remove the law, you have chaos. It brings darkness. It brings darkness. And God is permitting an object lesson to take place in front of our eyes. And humanity is going to jump onto a bandwagon and accept a set of norms and standards mm -hmm. which are not scriptural, but come from the minds of men. Yeah. May God give us wisdom to portray the character of God as it is portrayed in the word. In his law. We need to be people of the book. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your character lies on the highways of this world, trampled into dust. And you have called a people to represent you and to set the record straight. And Lord, you use erring people. You use people that have come from the very depths of depravity. And you send them into the world to restore the character of God. What a privilege. Allow us to be part of that process is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.